Won't you share my story? Please share my story. It could be our story if you'll give me your gift of life. Living donors make miracles happen. A number of you watching this are around 18. And that's when I started having kidney problems. So I had what was called pyelonephritis chronic acute. Acute because I kept on ending up in the hospital. Chronic because it lasted forever. And pyelonephritis is, is an infection that happens to the kidneys. And mine happened subsequent to urinary tract infections. So it kept happening and happening. And in spite of everything I did, and in spite of life's challenges, and in spite of being a plant-based person and going to doctors and, and getting the meds that I needed, when I was finally 60, I found myself in a situation where I required either dialysis, which I was told I was not a candidate for, or a transplant that would be able to keep me alive. So in February of 2018, I got the bad news. My doctor said, your numbers are such that we can't do anything more for you in order to stop this from happening. And basically, you're going to need a transplant. And the wait list in New York State, as many of you know, for a deceased donor is eight to 10 years. And I didn't have eight to 10 years. I had a few months. And what they wanted to do was to put me on hospice, which is keeping me as comfortable as possible in order to keep me <laughs> um, out of pain and buy me some time in order to, to pass away in a, in a way that that was doable. So I didn't really like that idea. I wanted to live. And I posted on Facebook that I really needed help in finding a living kidney donor. And my friend jumped on Facebook and said his friend had gotten a donor six months before that and that he would help me. So he made the necessary introductions. And I met with Ellis Mursky, who is now legal counsel to NKDO, the National Kidney Donation Organization. And he said that I needed to figure out why my life was worth saving. I had, I had done all kinds of amazing things during my life. I had two kids. I worked for 40 years. As a speech pathologist, I, I'm an environmental activist. I, I, I thought I had a great story for, for keeping me alive. The problem was not crying long enough so I could write it down. And once I wrote it down, Ellis was able to turn my compelling story into a website. And in March of 2018, I was evaluated to see if I could be approved as a recipient. And fortunately, May of 2018, I was approved. And that's when the hard work started. So it wasn't like it was not hard enough to get evaluated and to be approved. There's all kinds of tests that, that were making it very difficult. And as these months ticked by, I, I kept getting sicker and sicker and the tests get, kept getting harder and harder. But finally, I was approved. And what I needed to do was to share this website. And in six weeks, through all kinds of miracles, I was able to get 32,600 views of my website. 
So these are some of the ways that I that I got my views. I had a calling card and mine mine said um to-do list. And and on the to-do list was water your plants, pick up your mail, and see, see if you're eligible to give a kidney. And what I really wanted was people not to just get tested. I wanted them to share my story because I didn't know enough people. But all the people that I did know knew other people that they could share my story to. And that ripple effect of, of sharing my story to one person that knew 100 people and another person that, that had a, a newspaper that went out with wide circulation to people living around me. And social media had so many different contacts that I was able to keep sharing my story. I had some creative ways that I shared it. I would sit down on the floor of an elevator. Not that I um, wanted to, but I was so sick that I couldn't stand up. And when people said, why are you sitting on the floor instead of standing? I'd say, I'm, I'm very weak and I'm so sick that, and I really need a kidney. So here's my card. Please share my story. I'm not thinking you're gonna give me your kidney, but I'm thinking that by knowing that I need a kidney, that you can help me to share my story. If I went into McDonald's, which isn't a great place to go, um, but I, I'd go in and they'd say, what will you have? I, I'd say, I'll have a kidney. And I'd say it as loudly as I could. And people would look at me like I was nuts. And I'd hand them my calling card and say, please consider getting tested. Please share my story. I was in a local magazine spread that a friend of mine did, and and that that was super helpful in getting more shares. And every day I would watch the analytics on social media going up and up. And I kept saying, okay, so today we've got 20,000. Can we get to 25,000? And by the time I got to 32,600, my swap donor came forward. So he was tested in July of 2018 and approved very quickly. So that in August of 2018, we were able to enter what's called paired exchange because he was not a blood match. I needed an A positive and he was a B positive. And so through my hospital, which is um, affiliated with the National Kidney Registry, we are able to enter Parrot Exchange and they put together a chain. And then we were told that the chain was ready and that my transplant would be in October. So in October, I was transplanted and my kidney mama, um, was was the head of the chain she gave at UCLA. My swap donor was in the same hospital with me, and and they both healed mir miraculously quickly. And she even didn't like the hospital's coffee and walked to Starbucks immediately after transplant. So I was finally able to reach her. I wanted to know so badly who she was, and. By May of 2021, I was able to, to be in touch with, with Carrie, and we met in person finally in L.A. a year ago in March of 2022. This is the morning of transplant. My partner had shared my story with an email blast to 300 of his closest friends, and Ed Holowinko responded and said, if this is real, I'll give her my kidney. And he assured him that that it was real. And and so that morning, his wife, Beth, gave us all shirts. And here we are right, right before transplant. So this is the video of my meeting Carrie in person. She's my kidney mama. Lisa is about to meet the woman who saved her life. So excited. This meeting has been two years in the making.
I'm here because of Carrie's kidney inside me. If, if I didn't have her kidney, my life would have been over. For Lisa, her journey to optimal health has been a long one. When I was 18, I had pyelonephritis chronic acute. That led ultimately after 40 years to kidney failure. So I was told that I either needed a kidney transplant or dialysis. Little did Lisa know she wouldn't have to wait long. I have always been an individual who wanted to find ways to help people. And it's just been a passion since I was very young. In her journey to help others, she discovered the need for kidney donors. When I re researched it, there was over 90,000 people on the registry in the United States who all needed kidneys. And I realized that, you know, it didn't matter to me who I was donating a kidney to. Kerry registered with the National Kidney Registry. After a couple of failed attempts to find a match, Kerry finally got the call she had been waiting for. They came back to me about another week later and said, we have a match and this time it's a chain and we're going to be able to help several people on that same week. Surgery was successful and the two women went back to their regular lives, but both longed to know about the person who had changed their life. So I was told by my transplant center that I could not find out or communicate with my donor for a year. And then on the one year anniversary of having Carrie's kidney, I finally reached out. I sent a, a typed letter with a, eternal gratitude to Carrie. I wrote her a letter um, after the transplant that she never received. She wrote me a letter that I never received. So we never had the opportunity to connect initially. And when COVID occurred, I knew she lived in New York. So I sent her another letter and said, I just really hope that you're not impacted by COVID. And I hope that my kidney donation has given you an opportunity to be healthier, especially in the light of this pandemic. And surprisingly, that was the first letter of mine she ever actually received. And from the first sentence I just kept crying and I was just so happy to finally know who she was. After communicating back and forth for more than a year the two women finally get to meet. hug my kidney mama was the best feeling in the world and to be able to thank her for my gift of life and keeping me alive for me to help others and for me to be here for my family I, 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 I just have no words thank you so much for being here you're welcome <laughs> oh. sharing sharing a kidney oh, yeah right it's great to yeah Carrie asked me whether um, I had any food cravings after getting her kidney. And we figured out that we both liked chocolate fudge and we both liked chips and the salsa. But what I realized was that the moment I woke up, I had this insatiable urge to help other people so that they were not going to have to suffer as much as I had and so that they could find their living kidney donor. And since then, as a microsite coach, I've helped over 400 people. Um, many, About 20% of them have found their living kidney donors. And I've also spoken to lots of groups such as yours, encouraging people not just to help others to sign up for deceased donation, but also to consider whether they are eligible and suited to be a living kidney donor. So that's why I wanted to speak to your group was so that I could encourage you to, to do the same in your advocacy work.
and and there is such a tremendous need. As you pointed out in New York State, we we want the most kidneys or we need the most kidneys, but but there's so few people that are willing to sign up to be a deceased donor and even fewer who are willing to get tested and see if they can be eligible to be a living kidney donor. So I have a Facebook group called Kidney Stories with over a thousand members. It's a public group. You're welcome to check that out. I'm an admin on a number of additional Facebook kidney groups. I run a Toastmasters group that meets the first and third Sunday night of each month. And we've had a number of featured speakers talking about their need for a kidney and their experience as a kidney donor. I have a website called kidneystories.com. I actually wrote a song that's on that website. I wrote the words and Rod McDonald put it to music. So you can see that on my website. And I'm working with David Chrisman, who is somebody you really should interview. He's in Marina Del Rey, um, right? I guess that's part of Los Angeles. And he has a website called the Great Social Experiment.net. And that puts out the microsites that I'm using. So those microsites are completely free. The person gets a QR code, they get t-shirts, they get a place to put their story and their videos similar to when I had my website. And he makes it so easy for them to be able to share their compelling story. And then I work with them to help them to know how to share it and to encourage them to be able to give their elevator pitch. What encouraged you to like, almost like devote so much of your time around like organ donation after you received your own transplant. Um, like, I feel like a lot of people receive organ transplants, yet not all of them go to the lengths that you have it, to help others as well. So what motivated you almost, I'll ask, and almost what advice would you give to other people um, who may want to pursue similar goals as yourself? Okay, so... I think that it was, it was an insatiable urge that I had when I woke up from from getting my transplant that I I just felt like that it had if if I could get 32,600 views in a 6 week period and somebody came forward to help me that I was obligated to do the same for someone else. So I was, you know, given the experience, the the um, I was called by Ellis and, and he said, you know, would you like to try to help a few people and realized that, that I could, that I had, you know, gone through it and that my my experience was useful to them. And I just I found myself just getting deeper and deeper into into caring about others that, that are in need of, of a, a life saving kidney transplant you know how how can you i turn my back on somebody that needs me so you know and i i guess time wise um i'm retired as a speech pathologist i think i've always cared about others but i you know with, with the pandemic certainly and post transplant it was hard for me to go back into families homes so it gave me something to do to help others with with their needs Thank you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are glad that you chose to help them. Um, and uh, as a speech pathologist, uh, how, how do you feel like your professional skills and experiences in that field almost now complement your work in like helping kidney patients and promoting organ donation? Yeah, so let's go back to the fact that you guys are all students. Um, as, a, as a student, I, I have a degree in psychology. I've got a degree in speech pathology. I worked in families' homes, helping them with their two-year-olds who um, were in early intervention and were not speaking, and with their preschoolers who, who had a lot of communication issues and working with the moms and, and showing them what they needed to do in order to help their kids to learn to speak. 
was not very far removed from talking to, to these same women and saying, look, I can help you to, to get yourself a kidney. So I think the, the fact that I had the background in psychology and speech pathology and education in, in social media through doing all of that, um, it, it gave me the skills that I needed to have in order to be able to share my experience as a speech, as a, as a um, kidney recipient. You know, I, I, my kids had issues. I, a lot of kids have issues. You know, they, they, um, they, they were far from perfect and, and they, they had, you know, different educational needs. So by sharing my stories with these moms about how my kids got through that and how I helped them to get through that so that they would grow up to be functioning adults and, and professionals and um, to do amazing things. It, it, it's, not, it's not that different from saying, look, I have a need. I had people that helped me with my need and now I'm here to help you with your need through the stories I'm telling you about this. So I, I think that there's a lot to be said about using storytelling in healing and in educating. And that when we give these personal stories about experiences that we've gone through, that has a strong influence on people that are going through those same journeys. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, and sort of similar question, I guess. Um, how, how did you find the process of searching for a living kidney donor and like now helping other people through a similar process, empowering rather than discouraging? Because um, I feel like it's very almost discouraging to like reach out to 32,000 people, but then only one, like you, I feel like there's a lot of hoping and just like, how do you maintain such a positive mindset? I'll ask um, throughout that process. Is it a support group, family, or other other things? Um, yeah. Right. So I, I just shared a blog on Slow It Down CKD, and CKD stands for chronic kidney disease. So it was a guest blog, and I'll be putting it on my own website tomorrow. And it was all about the day that I found out I needed a kidney. And I, I was not positive, far from it. I couldn't stop crying. And I, I needed help, right? Because I, um, I couldn't get past my own, out of my own way and past my own emotions in order to help myself. So I sought the help of a counselor and um, he, he was great, right? He, he, one of the things he said to me is if I ever wanted to give up and, and I, I just wanted to end everything and get out of the pain and, and just walk away from it, he wasn't going to stop me. And so like knowing that I could always make that decision to just give up was empowering, but it was tough to stay super positive and, 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 and to stay, you know, away from my own, negative haunts in order to to be my own best advocate and I think like the other thing that really helped is that when I talked to people about needing help they were there to help me so they were the ones that were keeping me positive they were the ones that were motivating me to make a yard sign make calling cards talk to somebody that had been through it. You know, I just, I had so many great angels in my life. And I think the other part for me was it went really, really quickly. Like, I don't know, I keep asking this question. I don't know what was different four and a half years ago in 2018 when I got my kidney than what we're facing now. Some people say it's because we're post-pandemic. Some people say that um, there's just so much more competition that in spite of the fact that we have Facebook or we have other social media outlets, there's so many people out there that are sharing the same need that 
the numbers are, don't seem to be there. The, the best numbers that I know of right now are because people are paying for ads through Facebook or paying for billboards or, you know, wearing a sandwich board and walking the boardwalk at, at uh, Wildwood in New Jersey near Atlantic City or, you know, something similar to that, having an airplane with a banner behind it. But all of that costs money. And in our culture, like we can't buy a kidney. It's illegal in our country, but we can spend as much money as we have in order to save our own lives. I didn't really need to spend money. I mean, I was very fortunate that I I got so many views and that I had had so many connections before ever needing them. I I was part of a lot of different groups. You know, I didn't mention that I had a camp that shared it in their alumni spotlight or my my son who's an actor had been at a theater camp and theater classes and they shared it and and I had a an environmental group with 10,000 people that shared it so there were just a lot of people there for me not everybody has those contacts but I don't want you to think for a moment that there was anything positive I was dying I, I I felt horrible all the time. I had, you know, I was constantly throwing up. I always had a metal taste. I couldn't stand. I couldn't walk. Every test I went through was hell. So to stay positive during that, I didn't. But I, I found a donor in, in six weeks. So my clients are not. I have clients that have been looking for a very long time and living on dialysis. and. I'm wondering what they can do. And I keep sharing my ideas, but sometimes it's just not enough. So it no, that that positive attitude is is really tough. I've spoken to people that that seem like they're positive in spite of what they're living with and in spite of dialysis and in spite of the frustrations. But I th- I I don't know. I think it's an act or it's faith in God or something, but I didn't have that. You know, a lot of people have very supportive families. My family really felt like it was up to me to take care of this, not up to them. So, you know, they're supportive in other ways. They just thought that I, I was going to be better on dialysis than than trying to find a kidney. So and it's not easy. There's there's nothing easy about it. Certainly. But like, as you said, like seeking out help themselves, like counselors, that certainly was helpful for you and like very helpful yeah and I found keeping a journal was helpful support groups is helpful you know I had like my friends that were very very supportive I think that that's important um but yeah having a counselor was helpful it still is you know it's just because you get a kidney doesn't mean that that you're over this journey right um post transplant i've had a lot of things go wrong um so i herniated two days afterwards and i'm living with a hernia that cannot be repaired and for some reason um i never have enough blood supply to my brain and my upper body so when i stand up my pressure drops and um and and that makes it really hard to stand up so i'm in in physical therapy twice a week and you know he coaches me on what I need to do and I try to increase the salt in my diet it, it's there's a lot of challenges this is not a cure this is just you know for many people a solution to a lifelong issue you know there are people that are recipients that are climbing Mount Kilimanjaro I'm not one of them if I can if I can, you know, walk a couple of blocks without needing to sit, I'm, I'm doing well. You know, and I sit for a few minutes and then I walk a couple more blocks and I'm still traveling. I'm still living my life, but it's it's challenging. There's It's not easy. Certainly. Thank you for sharing so much. I know I've taken up an hour of your time. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I, I've got all the time you need. I'd, so- I'd rather have you have answers than than not. And I think it's wonderful that at your age that you're even interested in in this solution at all. 
Yeah, thank you. <laughs> We're doing our best as much as we can uh, at our ages, especially. So if yeah, I, I saw that ODAC goes into schools and talks about this. Do you think that this story would be useful to to talk about in a high school? Would that encourage people to to look into seeing if they're eligible and signing up to be a deceased donor? I mean, I certainly think so. Um, I feel like myself, especially what a lot of people are looking for in many cases, and like a lot of stories is like something to connect to personally. Um, and really, it's just that one story that you never know when you're going to hear that might just be that like tip over the edge into, oh, I really want to do this now. Won't you share my story? Please share my story. It could be our story if you'll give me your gift of life.